Good. Hello, everyone. I started to say good morning, and I realized that in some places it's good afternoon, and in some places it's good evening. It's a worldwide call. <laughs> so beautiful to see your beautiful faces. It means so much to me that we come together like this uh, once a month. It's been uh, for many years now. And 10 years uh, since Called by Love was formed. And it's just so beautiful to me to know that we have this kind of a community that feels this call to love, that lives it. And that is very clearly uh, the commitment of my life is to live love. And what do I think that means? <laughs> Well, we're going to be talking about that. Love is the answer. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean it's always the same answer? Does it always show up the same way? What I've found out in my life is the answer to that question is no. It shows up in lots of different ways, depending on where we are in our life, depending on the circumstances in our life, depending on the uh, people that show up expectedly or unexpectedly in our life, depending on who's part of our vibrational field and how we are part of their field. I just saw Ed show up. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Ed has a, a quote that I actually uh, quoted from him in my book. And it says, we were important cogs in each other's wheel of life. And so we're going to be talking about some of that today and how it shows up now in this now moment and what is the now moment. I, in the last uh, 21 days, interesting, 21, that says it takes 21 days to imprint a new pattern in your life. The last 21 days have been some of the most chaotic, uh, surprise, uh, filled with uncertainty, filled with unknowing. My brother fell on the ice in Colorado and has been in the hospital for 21 days, and he came home yesterday. So, yes, yes, Bruce, <laughs> yes. Oh, when I talked to him last night, he was so happy. He said, oh, Thank you, thank you, thank you for getting me out of that place. <laughs> and it was chaotic. So I may talk a little more about that, but I'm really curious what chaotic experiences have you experienced in the last 21 days or the last 21 years <laughs> or beyond that. Um, it's it, Time exists within timelessness. And so there's no way for us to understand it except through understanding time in the container of timelessness. All of you know how much I love to uh, start these uh, weekly, I mean, these monthly uh, conversations with music. And what I realized as I thought about would I do that today is that it would depend on where I was in my life. And I have different uh, songs that are, I, I call them all love songs. I have different songs for different periods of my life and different songs with different people. <laughs> do you have any of that experience? So I thought about the songs that I've absolutely loved and uh, how important they've been in my life. I thought about, uh, Andy Williams and Love Story. And actually, a, a, a phrase from that is the beginning of one of the chapters of my book, in my book. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that today, my book. Uh, many of you have it, um, Your Soul's Invisible Codes, Unveiling Your Sacred Love Story. There's a chapter in my book that is totally relevant today, that that particular chapter is called It's Written on Your Heart. So one of the songs that I loved was Andy Williams and Love Story and the beginning line of that, where do I begin? 
to tell the story of a love that never ends. And then another song that I absolutely loved, that was one of the love stories of my life, uh, was As Time Goes By from Casablanca, <laughs> a movie that actually Humphrey Bogart starred in. Uh, Georgia, I'm sure you probably are aware of that <laughs> and, and how beautiful that is. And, you know, a kiss is just a kiss. A sigh is just a sigh. The fundamental things apply as time goes by. Casablanca. And another uh, song that I just totally, totally loved was uh, The Way We Were. Uh, yeah, Barbara Streisand sings so beautifully and Ed's holding up his thumb. I think that is probably a reflection of our love story, Ed. You know, uh, the way we were. And we have a specific time in our lives that we remember with absolutely a deep, deep love. And that was uh, actually, I, th I think we were both in our 20s in these, those years. Is that right? I, th I think we met in 1972. And um, so anyway, I know we met. In uh, Marge. Yeah. Marge, that movie was on TV just two nights ago. Oh, my God. we were. <laughs> Did oh, you watch I mean, it? <laughs> oh, yes. What an incredible movie. And the music. The music just tingles your heart. I so, know. So, oh, yeah. that it, is. It was kind of a sad movie in the end. Yeah. yeah. The, yeah. the way they broke up. But what a love story. The way they <laughs> broke up and then the way they came back together years later. Yeah. And saw each other in front of the hotel. Actually, I think you and I took some pictures in front of that hotel and uh, on the carriage ride in Central Park. <laughs> New Year's Eve, right. Yeah. <laughs> So okay. we have those kinds of memories of unforgettable love. And another one of my favorite love songs is I Will Always Love You by Whitney Houston. And just beautiful, beautiful songs. And another favorite is All the Way. <laughs> That's one of the love songs that I just, that was life changing for me. Uh, Celine Dion and Frank Sinatra singing together with uh, Celine Dion in the physical and Frank Sinatra in the invisible. And that love song in my life represents the time in my life that I knew Ron. And uh, we we had he was my first love story when we were teenagers 13 14 and 15 and then he found me again in my 70s so love stories in our lives are sometimes so deeply impacting and you know i that song all the way came to me in a dream when ron and i had reconnected in our 70s and i knew that uh something was happening cosmically and didn't really know what it was. So um, another love story, a love song that I love is Leonard Cohen <laughs> and Dance Me to the End of Love. Oh, I, there's something in that is just profoundly. And there's one version of it that shows couples over many, many years from the time that they met until the end of their lives and how in the beginning they're young and beautiful and, and at the end of their lives, uh, they're aging and going through the, the natural experiences of what happens in our lives. And then it, the final one I'm going to mention today, instead of using a song, the final one I'm going to mention is Somewhere. And that was a, a love song where, that Bar Barbara Streisand sang when she partnered with Josh Groban. And this was uh, before he was famous, <laughs> she was famous, <laughs> but uh, the words to that song are profoundly beautiful. There's a place for us somewhere. There's a place for us peace and quiet and open air wait for us. There's a time for us, someday a time for us. Time to learn, 
time to care. Someday, somewhere, we'll find a new way of living. We'll find a way of forgiving. You know, in the experience of uh, my uh, chaotic time this week with my brother, I had a conversation with his daughter and, and she made a statement to me. Uh, my dad uh, abandoned my mother and I many, many years ago. Well, that wasn't totally true because uh, at that time that she's calling abandonment, he was deeply immersed in a drug experience that involved cocaine, which he came out of and actually cold turkey. Uh, by going back to church, I said, Willard, you need to find God again. I flew to Colorado, took him to uh, Unity of Boulder. I thought he would love it. He hated it. Everyone was greeting me and saying, oh, Marge, it's so great to see you. And they were ignoring him. He does not like to be ignored. <laughs> Have you ever had that experience of not liking to be ignored? <laughs> and the next Sabbath, Saturday, he went back to the church we grew up in, in Boulder, Boulder Seventh-day Adventist Church. And he got very involved in Bible study. He got very involved in working and visiting seniors in hospitals and uh, in home care environments. And, and the last seven years of my father's stepfather's life, he took care of him 24-7 every day. I took him out for a ride in the wheelchair, took trips with him in his wheelchair. They traveled in a pickup truck and broke down in Florida once, and I had to email them money <laughs> to get the truck fixed. These are all parts of love stories. What did you do for love? So that's a really important question today. What did you do for love? So back to the words of that song, somewhere, somewhere there's a place for us. I'm still wondering where that place is for me in my life. I thought it could be Kansas City. I thought it could be Colorado. I don't like ice and snow particularly. I wonder if it's Tustin. I've thought about Oregon coastline. What is my place? Where will I end up as I prepare to go through the veils? Will I find the people that love me and care for me when I don't know how to do it myself? I don't have that in place right now in my mind. I have it in my heart, but not in my mind. And so the last two lines of the word somewhere, the song somewhere, hold my hand. Interestingly, all my brother wanted when he was in the hospital was for his beloved partner who has severe memory loss herself to hold his hand and to talk to him. He didn't even like it when I called and talked to her because she couldn't talk to him and me at the same time. <laughs> uh, hold my hand. We're halfway there. Hold my hand and I'll take you there. So he came home yesterday uh, and beloved friends that I have that now live in Boulder, that I met at Unity in Tustin, Johnny Thomas and Kathleen Cepeda Miller, helped me find 24-hour day, 24-hour uh, care for him at home. When I uh, uh, disputed a discharge uh, from the community hospital that would have put him in lockdown in an Alzheimer's unit, only to be reviewed every 90 days. And I said, that's not my brother. That doesn't work for me. I'm disputing it. And I did to Medicare. And at, at the end of that time, interestingly, you know, other things emerge. And uh, a call from the community hospital that if I didn't have him out within um less than uh, 24 hours uh noon the next day that i would be charged eight thousand five hundred dollars a day for his hospitalization pressure can come with love 
pressure, catastrophe, surprise, shock. How do I deal with this? And, and I called, 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 Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit, quoted the promise over and over and over again, you know, and it came through for me. Holy Spirit, or the promise, there will be nothing else I will not arrange for you without your effort. The Holy Spirit will go before you, making straight your path and leaving no stone to trip on, no obstacles to bar your way. And that's just part of that phrase. I've shared the, that quote from the promise with many of you many times. And then yesterday, I called and talked to his caregiver, a beautiful Pakistani woman that has lived in the United States for 20 years and been a caregiver and is a really close friend of Kathleen Cepeda that I knew from Unity of Tustin, who now lives in Boulder. And this beautiful, beautiful Pakistani woman who uh, prays to Jesus because she was raised Catholic and also prays to uh, Krishna, Ramakrishna, because of her Eastern uh, spiritual background. Uh, she prays to Krishna and she says, I pray every day. I wake up at 3.30 3 or 4 in the morning and I pray. I'm praying for Willard. I'm praying for Mary Pat. I'm praying for you. I love that kind of prayer work. And I told her I was praying in the same way. And um, I hold my hand. My brother said, Oh, in the hospital, they said he couldn't even get to the bathroom alone. They had to have two nurses aside on each side of him. He couldn't even use the walker because uh, one arm was broken in the fall and, and it's in a sling. And it was impossible for him to even go to the bathroom alone. And yet they were discharging him. And, and I, uh, I objected. And my objection was declined, which gave me two hours before closing on a Friday afternoon to figure out what to do. Sometimes shifts in consciousness require our close attention, and it does not promise that the shift will be easy. It doesn't say anything in the uh, promise about all of this. Well, they did say it'll be without your effort, but it doesn't say they'll be easy. It doesn't even say they'll be gentle. <laughs> and so it has not been easy. It has not been gentle for me with my human mind. Yet what I found is that there is a part of me that totally knows, totally knows to trust, totally knows that all is well and all is well. And so that's exactly what happened with Joyce, this beautiful five foot tall Pakistani woman who simply helps Willard stand up and then says, hold my hands. I'm going to work, walk backwards and you hold my hands and we're going to walk to the bathroom. Well, he, excuse my language, <laughs> I'm quoting him, I have to pee. <laughs> and that's uh, sometimes four or five times a night or four or five, many, many times a day. Um, as happens to men in their older years, he has some prostate problems and, and uh, that's an urgency that he often feels and uh, has medication for that. But, you know, even the meds are a complicating factor because he's also a diabetic. And so <laughs> Joyce says, hold my hands, hold my hands and I'll take you there to the bathroom <laughs> and he put his hands in her hands and walked slowly and carefully, but walked multiple times. It's not only good exercise, it also got him to the bathroom where he wanted to go. And uh, Pete and Mary Pat walked with him in the hallway. They had to bring him in on an ambulance stretcher because there's four steps down to his garden level apartment in this uh, 
apartment building that Willard and I inherited from my parents, my mother and stepfather. And, um, and we co-own it now as a result of that inheritance. So thank God for that. So it's his apartment building <laughs> along with mine. And Joyce said, hold my hands. I will take you there. And then the song somewhere ends with the words, somehow, someday, somewhere. And so I, one of the questions I want you to explore today on this call as we talk about these things together is where, what is your somehow? What is your someday? What is your somewhere? I don't have all those answers for myself even now, and I'm 83 years old. So that's interesting for me to look at. I'm not quite 83, I turn 83 in April. And um, so I'm just continuing, you know, one of the love songs that I always loved uh, from the time I was a teenager is that love is a many splendored thing. So what we're going to be examining, looking at, considering today is uh, some of the many, many faces of love in our lives over time and in timelessness, visible and invisible. We'll be uh, potentially talking about the last 21 days or uh, 21 years. We'll talk about uh, blocks of times beyond that, maybe decades in our life. I have no idea what we're going to talk about because at one point, what I want to do is to go into the silence and let you do some writing and ask spirit to write in you and through you and as you. What I quoted in, my, in the reminder email that you all got uh, was uh, the quote from A Tale of Two Cities. Actually, it was a novel, and the quote was, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And I asked, have you ever experienced that? Have you ever wondered or doubted how love could possibly be the solution? Because the title of the theme idea for today for our call was love is the answer. How could love possibly be the answer to everything? It's because love, and this, this interesting was shocking for me when I first found out. When I was doing the research on stages of consciousness and stages of development that are based on integral and many other uh, Sri Aurobindo and many other pathways. Um, uh, I wanted to know something about my own state of consciousness. And, and, and I took an extended inventory with Terry O'Fallon, who developed it and working with Ken Wilbur as she did that. And when I said to Terry, I want to know how love develops. You didn't even mention the word love in any of the stems that you, and some of you have taken those inventories. Ed, you took one. Uh, Fabian, you took one. Um, uh, I, I don't remember, Bruce, if you did. Uh, maybe Marla did. I, can, I can't always remember who's taking them and, and who hasn't. And, uh, but you all know, you, if you did it yourself, and you all know where you landed at one moment in time, it's not a forever stamp on you. It's one moment in time where you were writing those words that completed the paragraph after the stem. One of the words when we developed a love stages inventory, Terry and O'Fallon and I, that was the one you took, Ed, love stages inventory, was uh, the stem simply love is dot, dot, dot. And you can write a paragraph about that. And, uh, and then ultimately, what you weren't always aware of, and I don't even understand it, because I've never learned how to, uh, it, how to score them or anything. I don't know how to do that. I don't even want to know. But they have people that are deeply trained in that. This is what happens and why they can score it based on what you write. 
if you write enough, sometimes you don't write enough and it's you didn't put down enough words on the page and it ends up not having anything to score you on because you're what you're really thinking about in your heart and your soul, you're not willing to put into words. Or maybe you don't even have the words for it yet because it's beyond words. I know one of the people I asked to take it was really upset when he got his result and he said, this isn't accurate. And I said, yeah, I know it's not because I've spent years talking to you about consciousness. I know that that's not accurate. I said, so what did you write? And of course that was the issue. He had written a very brief responses and had not really revealed his consciousness. Did you know that uh, those kinds of ways of knowing are extremely important. And uh, there's a verse in the Bible that uh, is in the first chapter of John, and it says, in the beginning was the word, <coughs> and the word was God. And, and <coughs> creation comes out of that. <coughs> Uh, I'm going to take a drink of water. Ed, would you uh, unmute yourself and talk about your experience maybe of taking that while I get a drink of water and mute myself <laughs> or Fabian? Sure. Okay. Uh, am I on? Yes, you're on. Okay, good. Well, um, my feeling of love is that uh, it comes from uh, a person engagement and nurturing. Uh, and I think when you have the elements of engaging and nurturing others, that's a sign and that's an exchange of, of love, loving and caring. Uh, and, and I think that that's kind of natural, but and not necessarily. I mean, I have a father who really never engaged, nor was he very nurturing. Um, and I guess you could say he loved me. But now I have two children and I know that they know that they're loved. But then I, uh, I, Ellen and I were always engaging and nurturing with them. In fact, as you know, Marge, I worked up at Boys Town at Father Flanagan's for three and a half years. And that was a challenge, but it was a, it was a great, it was a fun uh, challenge. And, and that's, that's what we expressed is the engagement in their lives and nurturing. Never put down, never necessarily a correction but just a normal engaging into what is in their best interest. And a lot of those children, they were probably in the, in the ages from like nine until till 18, uh, but some of them went off to college when they were 16, 17. But, and we had seven of them in the house, seven, seven boys. And um, it was a joy. Uh, and was it challenging? Sure, it was challenging. But once again, when we were able to engage and nurture with them, and nurturing means doing things with them uh, and not putting them down. If there's an issue, you don't put them down, you teach from it. Uh, and you talk about their feelings and the feelings that they're leaving when they say something to someone else. And it could be even towards animals. I mean, we had Tiffany who was a, our dog around the house and, and they, they treated Tiffany with all kinds of love and respect and care. Uh, cherishment and nurturing. So, uh, and that, and, and children get that also. And sometimes that's the best way to teach them is through animals. So, um, uh, and, and I, I think both of my children, of course, my son teaches second grade and uh, he is a, a loving, nurturing guy. Uh, and uh, my daughter, uh, Shana, who's about four years older, works for a big law firm and she's just a joy with her children. And she has a challenging husband, <laughs> but I mean, she's working through it. And, and I think that it's a, a reflection of um, the way that, that they were, were raised. So, and yeah. Ellen and I were always on the same path uh, with, uh, our, uh, with our, with uh, our relationship towards, you know, our, our children and to the, our relationship to the seven guys, eight guys that we had at Boys Town. So I'm going to ask you a question, Ed, <laughs> and if you don't want to answer it, you can say, I'd rather not talk about that. And that'll be absolutely perfect. So you're talking about these beautiful, loving, caring relationships. And I know those are 
really important and beautiful in your life. I've always admired that. But this is what I want to ask you, and you may not want to talk about it. You and I met in 1972. We had a passionate romance. And, um, and then after we had lived together for a couple of years, I went to New York with your total support. You actually took care of Bud um, during the summer while I was gone uh, to work for uh, the summer as a volunteer with the feminist press. And, and then I made a decision uh, uh, to go back and live there for a year because I'd gotten a Rockefeller grant to do work for them for a year. And I took a year's leave of absence from Oak Park High School and uh, went to New York and, and began my doctoral program at the University of Massachusetts. Now, see, these are all experiences of love for me. I'm talking about the experience of love for my son was there, the experience of love for you was there, the experience of love of curriculum was there, the experience of love of uh, uh, purpose. And I was very uh, tuned into some of the experiences of women. And <laughs> you said to me one night when we were uh, actually sitting in bed talking and, and I was reading to you out of Ms. Magazine, I doubt that you remember this. And, uh, and, and it was about how, you know, women uh, had sort of gotten the short end of the stake in our culture. And you said, stop, don't, I don't even want to hear that. I don't treat you that way. <laughs> so let's, when I, when I made the decision to, um, to go from New York, Long Island, New York, to the University of Massachusetts and uh, do my doctoral degree, you said, I invited you to go with me. And you said, I'm sort of a, I'm a Midwest kind of guy or something right. like that. <laughs> and, and I remember you saying this, you say you never said it. So this is our different memories, but I, um, my memory, which may or may not be accurate, was that you said to me, if you do that, don't expect me to wait for you. This is actually clear language, clear communication. And that Byron um, Katie always says, be able to say a clear yes or a clear no. <laughs> and so it's real interesting. So um, we had a passionate romance. So talk to me about your experience of how a passionate romance, most people think of love as a passionate romance. That's the stereotype hallmark version. <laughs> how, is, how was your experience of passionate romance different from your experience of uh, caring and uh, that you experienced at Boys Town or even with your family? Well, first of all, that situation is, you're exactly right. It's not that I'm a Midwestern person. I think I also said, I don't want to go live in the East. Yeah. And you were going to New York. <laughs> and there's no way me growing up in St. Louis and finding the freedom in Kansas City uh, that I wanted to go even further East to New York City. So that was clear. And the other thing is, is I was in my early 30s, mid, mid 30s, I guess. I was born in 41. So, yeah. And you had already been married and already had a child. So you had a family. Now, I, I did not have, a, a, I, I had, had been divorced, but uh, Annie and I did not have children. And it was an amicable divorce. But, you know, I was looking at, you know, what's in the future, you know, with, with, with me. Uh, and as you recall, I met you at a dance at Arrowhead, and I saw you. I was a, a, up a distance from you, and what drew me to you was your radiance. I mean, you were just radiant. I mean, I don't know what it was, but it was, and you were talking to a bunch of people. And I walked up to you and I asked you to dance, and you said, "Well, you know, I'm talking to all these folks. You know, maybe later." So you all split up. You went out, and 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 I followed you up and asked you to dance and. We danced and the rest was history. <laughs> so, <laughs> so how, how, 
how is our romance different than the caring at Boys Town? Well, the, uh, well, first of all, there was Buddy. Uh, and um, let's see, I actually, I had not been to Boys Town yet at that time in my life. I, we, we, we went later because Aunt, uh, Ellen and I went, were, were house parents there. And I had not met Ellen at that time. But how, how is it different? I, I, I don't think there's any particular difference. I mean, love is love. Love is more of a, of a looking at someone else and what are their needs and putting their needs and cares ahead of your own. Um, and so I, I think it's on the same plateau. You know. So these are the, and thank you, Ed, for letting me call on you and ask you some uh, personal question. <laughs> and thank you for your willingness to participate so authentically. I really appreciate that. These are some of the things I want us to be aware of as we think about these questions today. What happens in, and I've now done about five or seven years of deep dive research on love stages and how love shifts and changes. What shocked me when I began doing this research is that love, and Terry told me this, and I don't know if this is still true, but it was at that time in all of the thousands of, of inventories that she had done, that love was the only word that shows up in every stage of development. And this is, you know, from the time you're born, when you are totally helpless and you have absolute total need of receiving love from all through the stages of your life, childhood, teenage years, 20s, 30s, 40s, decades of your life, to the end of your life. And the way that love shows up is different. It changes in its physical form. It changes in even the emotional way that it shows up. And people give different answers to that stem of love is, depending on where they are in their own developmental stages. And so what happens is that words appear and then they dissolve or they disappear. And new words, and new levels of awareness emerge, and then they dissolve ultimately. And actually, I knew there was 12 levels. I've known that for a long time because of the book of Revelation and the last book of the Bible. It mentions 12 over and over and over again. And so there, there's receptive stages, like when you're a baby, when you're coming out of college or just beginning your career and you were probably there, we were both in our um, uh, early 30s, uh, Ed, when we had our passionate romance, we were still defining our lives oh, and, sure. and loving different things. And my, <laughs> one of my loves was uh, education. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it ended up, if it hadn't have been for you, Ed, probably I wouldn't have the doctoral degree that I oh, do now. I agree. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so love is experienced in really different kinds of ways and many kinds of experiences. Me doing a doctoral program was an experience of love for me. Yeah. yeah. And I loved it enough that I drove from Long Island, New York to uh, Amherst, Massachusetts and commuted once a week in order to do that. I mean, that's a pretty serious kind of love. It can include romance. It can include family. It can include friends. It can include work and it can include work relationships, all different kinds of love, different faces of love. And it includes things like passion. Now, <laughs> um, the Enneagram has a somewhat a negative a definition of passion saying, you know, that that's one of the lower levels. And I think passion is ultimately one of the highest levels. Uh, the, the week that changed the world. Uh, this is the, the week between um, uh, uh, Palm Sunday and Easter is called Passion Week. 
And that's when Jesus does the triumphal entry and then is crucified, arrested and crucified, betrayed by Ju Judas. So there's some difficult stuff in that week. And, and ultimately hung on a cross between two other people, one that recognizes his consciousness, the other that doesn't. And then um, he, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That would be my word to my niece that said, my dad abandoned me. I would say to her, forgive him, for he knew not what he was doing. He was under the influence of altered consciousness as a result of participating, unfortunately. I'm really sad about this, that this happened, but it did. In his life and with cocaine for a period of time. <clears throat> and he lost every, everything in his life. And now he's built his way back. So, you know, <coughs> passion and purpose. And, you know, I still, and as I do the prayer, the, the promise, uh, when you accept God's plan is the one purpose that you would fulfill. That's when all of these promises come into act, being activated. So that's the purpose of my life is living love. And there's yearning in that. I still yearn for that kind of love. And I don't even know what the yearning is about. Maybe it's yearning for God. Maybe it's yearning to go home. Maybe it's uh, yearning for the knowing of the perfect kind of love. And it, does that even exist? I still experience what I call the yearning. Um, and, uh, you know, I thought that's one of the things I thought about when move, moving to Oregon and being on the coastline, yearning for the, I love the ocean and experiences, moments in time. It, uh, love can be about healing. It can be about um, maintaining our lives. And, and uh, many people live in the maintaining level for most of their lives and they don't change a whole lot through their lives. Uh, they, uh, you know, they, they, they don't go into this rare and advanced states of consciousness because they're they're living their normal lives and that and they're wonderful lives and they're full of beauty and full of grace and sometimes my brother lives a, a, a really good life uh, or at least did until recently and and he in, in no way has moved beyond the levels of success which on that scale is is an individualized state that is achieving. It's called the achiever state. And he was he was the number one Chevron dealer in a five state region and owned the Chevron dealership and was very, very successful in his career. So it it's so interesting, all of the ways love can show up. And yet my brother has not shifted out of that achiever state. And actually, he's moved into old age with that awareness of it. And there's a part of him that's now, as a result of that, demanding <laughs> because he's used to having his own way as a CEO. <laughs> Fascinating how all of this works. And um, love changes in the way it appears. It changes you. As you prepare, and as I prepare to go through the veils, ultimately we will go into a time of dissolve and ultimately we will do it in different ways. You know, maybe there, there's lots of ways to go through the veils, um, accidents, tragedies, uh, going to sleep at night, and never waking up, all kinds of ways to go through the veils. What the research also shows that I've been involved in, and this is, I'm so grateful that my, my curious mind keeps saying, there's more, there's more, and let me explore it. And uh, I've explored the research on uh, communication through the veils because my son was talking to me through the veils after he died when he was 45 years old. And then Ron, my beloved that I knew as a teenager, began talking to me through the veils. And that happened when I was going through the immense grief of that loss. And all of a sudden I knew that it was real because it was happening to me. 
the person who has been helping Willard that lives in the upstairs apartment is a construction contractor. And he's been trying to help Mary Pat, who is in severe memory loss and worries and worries and worries. And he, ta he was taking her to the hospital to be with Willard and, and she would worry and get him back home for the, uh, the evening. And then she was all worried and calling the hospital until she became a nuisance to the nurses. And, and, uh, and Pete, it said and they were out eating one evening and all of a sudden he's he's talking to her about uh you know we're going there every day he, we're doing everything we can for him to get better and he said all of a sudden everything changed and it was like uh, everything uh, my voice even became different he said this is a, a licensed contractor. I told him Jesus was a carpenter. <laughs> he says, yeah, I'm, people I work with sometimes joke about that. <laughs> but he said, my voice even changed. And I heard the words, don't worry, sweetheart. Or, I, or, don't worry, sweet one or yet little one and he said and i i just spoke those exact words that i was hearing and mary pat suddenly her eyes got all teary and she said my mother says that and her mother's on the other side of the veil she's died and so mary pat's mother was coming through pete to comfort Mary Pat, my mother. And she became calm and, and peaceful. So I am looking forward to finding out what's on the other side when I go through the veils. I don't have any fear of death. Actually, Rumi talked about it would be his wedding day. He wanted to go and be with Shams. And that's, and Rumi is, of course, the one that says, there is a field beyond right and wrong. I will meet you there. And so love is not an easily described. It will be described and defined by you depending on where you are in your life. And it will encompass the vastness both the visible and the invisible. It'll encompass different experiences. It'll encompass different people. Ed has mentioned several. He uh, mentioned Annie, his the first wife. He mentioned me uh, and, and he mentioned the children's mother and oh. Ellen. Uh, it, it will encompass different people. It will encompass destiny paths. It, it's spirit, soul, and body. And it includes both the visible in, in the physical world and it includes the invisible in the world beyond. And then the chapter in my book quotes a scripture and it says, it is written on your heart. And what I'm going to do right now is get my book and just quote a, a few words from that chapter. It's chapter 33 in my book, and it's entitled, It is Written on Your Heart. And I write that those words are very profound for me. I've looked at the faces of love in my life, and I realize how deeply I have loved. I mean, I've loved Ed very deeply. I've loved Ron very deeply. I loved Paul very deeply. I love Fabian very deeply. I mean, I can look on, uh, uh, I've loved Marla very deeply. I've loved Bruce very deeply. Bruce and I have a relationship that goes back many, many years. I've loved Patty very deeply. I've loved Dustin very deeply. Uh, do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, I've loved Kay very deeply. We don't limit our love to one person. We It just shows up in different dimensions. It, and one of the great gifts of recent 
um, experiences is some of the conversations we, I've had with Barbara and I've loved, I love Barbara very deeply, but they're different ways of love. I've loved Donald very deeply, deeply. Oh my God, the things we've shared uh, about when his life, when his life changed and uh, his wife had the experience of um, a, a stroke and Michaelia from Vienna became the person, a medical doctor became the person that supported him and counseled him. So different ways that we love in our life. Somehow I know that love, when it is real, this is from my book, never goes away. One of my other favorite love songs that I just posted and um, uh, is the song Endless Love. I posted that on Ron's uh, website that I still occasionally post things to because the last concert Ron and I attended together was Lionel Richie singing Endless Love. And it was, it, it, I'm sorry, it's one of my love songs. My vows real of love are written deeply on my heart. I've been Im immensely blessed with amazing relationships of love in my life with wonderful souls. And many of you, I just named you, are one, some of those. They are extremely clearly significant intersections in time that were part of my destiny path as you called them, we were important cogs in each other's wheel of life. Yeah. And destiny path, I am filled with gratitude. Yet, I write in my book, there is a new covenant in scripture for me that becomes confirmation from the beloved from spirit. This is the covenant I will make. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. When I found this in Jeremiah 31, 33, I knew that was where <laughs> my covenants are recorded. The mystical marriage becomes illumined with love <laughs> and wisdom that is not of this world. It is not necessarily recorded in the human plane courthouses where documents can be honored or dissolved. It's written in your heart. And so those of you that have my book, you can continue to read the rest of that because I want to leave time for you to share. Um, what is written on your heart? What are you yearning for? So our I want our call today, and we um, have a little over 30 minutes left, to be a really important one for all of us, because I want you to share some of your awareness. And I want to go into a time of at least three minutes of silence before you do that, because you need to listen to the whispers. You need to listen to spirit revealing the levels of capital A awareness of small a awareness. It's both human and divine. The capital A awareness is divine awareness. You need to get in touch with the answers that are vibrations of your field of consciousness that is related to timelessness as well as time. You know, who knows? Maybe some of us have had past lives together. I would not be surprised at that. Uh, Patty, you're writing about your ancestors and you recently sent me an email about that. You're a person I've loved. Have we had a past life together? We worked together at all of these years at Unity of Tustin. Bruce, have we had a past life together? <laughs> you know, the, uh, interesting, interesting questions. Bobian, have we had a past life together? We sort of got ahead of that when we uh, did Ancestry.com. We were shocked to find out that we had overlapping areas where we had lived in past lives. 
so many examples. So I, I want to go into um, three minutes of silence right now. So I invite you to get a piece of paper out and I'm going to use my uh, iPhone and I'm going to time it. Uh, when we are in the silence, I'm going, before I start the three minutes, I'm going to invoke the Holy Spirit. And so be sure you have a piece of paper. You can jot down words. Don't try to do sentences. It's too complicated. Just words or phrases that drop in. Maybe names, experiences, people. Maybe it's a, simply something you've yearned for. Uh, Georgia, I know uh, you and I have talked about some of your life and the experiences that you've had uh, because your beloved has passed through the veils and, and you have another beloved son that lives with you now who happens to be Fabian's beloved. <laughs> it's so fascinating how our lives intersect in time. And, you know, Daniel, oh my God, you've had wonderful beloveds in your life. I think I'm one of them. You're certainly one of them in my life. And yet you have a beautiful, beautiful family of beloveds. So it, it's really important. So as we go into the silence and invoke this, you know, Marla potentially Bud will come in and talk to you because you were his beloved. It, it, all of these beloveds in our lives, visible and invisible. And so let's go into three minutes of silence. But before we do that, what I want to do is to invoke the beloved. So just hold your hand on your heart. That tends to uh, reinforce your dropping out of your head into your heart. Your heart has over a thousand times more capacity for knowing these sacred things than your head does. Your head is limited by the rational mind. It can support the heart, but it does not have the power of the heart. And the power of the heart is a thousand times more powerful. And so what I'm inviting you to do is to drop into your heart. And we'll simply invoke the Holy Spirit, invoke the power of love to give you whispers, to give you signs or symbols of the great loves of your life that are still pot potentially part of your destiny path, part of your yearning. It's not gonna be limited to things you've experienced in the past because this is in the now moment that includes past, present, and future as one. The now moment continues to shift in time from moment to moment to moment to moment. So every 24 hours, you have a new now. Every, every hour, you have a new now. All of the feelings you have are part of that now. If they're destructive or negative feelings, they'll pull you down. If they're, if they're maintaining feelings, they'll keep you in the status quo. If they are uh, shifting feelings that were taking you into higher levels of union and awareness with the beloved, visible and invisible, uh, they'll give you glimpses of that, but nothing that can be understood by your rational mind. And so in this now moment, we invoke that power the power of the heart, the power of the soul, the power of love. And we ask for those whispers, those glimpses, that capital K knowing that has been guiding and leading our lives through many, many lifetimes. And we'll spend three minutes in the silence and then we'll go into some sharing and as we go into the sharing, you can continue to jot down things that may continue to come in the silence, in the silence, in the silence for three minutes.
as we begin to come back into awareness of our room together, this beautiful experience of sitting in this room that extends around the world. Who would like to share something that they got? Uh, maybe something has surprised you even. Uh, raise your hand. You can either do it this way or you can go down and uh, under reactions, there's a place that says raise hand at the bottom of your screen, but doing it this way is fine. I see Bruce. Okay, Fabian, do you want to share? Or who did you, what did you say? Um, I saw Bruce hand. Okay, Bruce. Let's start with Bruce. Let's start with Bruce. Hi, Marge. Hi, everybody. Hi, Bruce. Hi, Bruce. So good to be here this morning. Good to see you. Uh, I'd like to say, uh, uh, you know, I really, uh, I was kind of drawing a blank because I was a bit distracted about something I wrote to a dear friend uh, just yesterday, <clears throat> which I thought was so perfect for all these called by love calls, which I, I would like to share if I can. Of however, course you can. However, I did, uh, I thought, well, I want to do what Marge says. And <laughs> so I went into the silence and just these few words came out and they were pretty clear. Uh, and I'll just read them. Suffering, elation, depression, joy, lightness, <laughs> heaviness, love without an opposite. Notice the polarities in that, Bruce. I which, did. Which word draws you the most? Wow. Um, hmm. You chose one word that draws you the most. Which would it be? I think it would be joy. Joy. Oh, I love that one. <laughs> uh, you do realize that on David Hawkins' scale, that love is at the level of 500, and unconditional love is 560. Following that comes peace. It's the peace that passes understanding. Following that, Bruce, comes joy. It's a very, very high vibration. It's beyond happiness. It's, it's joy without an opposite. You know, when you and I talk, I love our conversations. I've known you for so many years. You used to be on the board at Unity in Tustin. We have had many, many years of uh, I mean, organizing silent retreats, all kinds of things. And we've had a few speed bumps, <laughs> but I think you and I can now laugh at them now. <laughs> and um, I think what we have is joy without an opposite. Uh, unmute yourself, Bruce. I didn't realize I'd muted. Um... As you know, I have some experience with all those opposites that I listed. What's the second one that you are drawn to? Well, I just I just wanted to say that I was aware that those were uh, uh, opposites, but then the last one, love without an opposite, sort of marries them all. It does. And, um, but I don't know, what did you just ask me? I ask you which other word, but you, I think you answered it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You, is the part you wanted to read long or? Uh, it's not long at all. Uh, I, I've met someone who I've become really fond of. Her name is Jen and we've known each other for a couple of years and we talk on the phone once in a while. I see her rarely. And then we, yesterday we we're trading a few texts and, and uh, and she's in a 12-step group with you. Is that right? Yep. A 12-step group. So, and so I'll just read this. It doesn't really need much of an introduction. And I was uh, continuing something we'd been sharing. And I said not to belabor the subject. But I truly believe that everything we do, think, and feel from the moment we are born is our effort to love and be loved. Period. 
I know it's true for me, and I've done some wildly extreme, crazy, even perverse, heck, especially perverse things uh, in my desperate hunger to simply love and be loved. The Beatles were right. Love is all you need. I believe that all the problems of individuals as well as global problems are the result of everyone's plea to not be judged and simply love and be loved. It's pretty clear to me that what I enjoy most about getting to know you is that I'm feeling love and I love feeling love. Thank you. That is wonderful. Really beautiful. Thank you, Bruce. And so who else? Oh, Lauren wants to come on. Uh, and if you notice up on the screen, the hand raised, the way you do that, if you've wondered, it go down to the bottom of your screen to where it says reactions, click on that. And what comes up down at the bottom of that is something that says raise hand. That's how you do that. Uh, so let's bring Lauren on. I think Hi, Lauren. Hi, Lauren. Can you uh, turn Hi. on your video by chance? Um, I'm not that technically savvy. I don't know how to do it at this point. Oh, let, let's do a tech lesson. So Fabian, okay. tell her how to do it. <laughs> well, on the iPhone, I'm not sure, but where you saw how to unmute, maybe next to it, there is also the a little camera where you can um, start the camera. But on the iPhone, I'm not sure which view you're seeing. But we can hear you. So no matter what, we can hear you. And I want to remember this before. Uh, so we need to come back and help Ed show him how to put Casey after his name. <laughs> so, but let's go back to Lauren right now. Actually, it's not Lauren. This is my daughter's phone, which her name is Lauren. But my name is Sharon. And Marge, we've met several, several times at the University of Tustin and I can say honestly that every single moment that I have spent with you has been a mutual expression of love you emanate love and I'm so grateful to have all those experiences and read all the wonderful newsletters you wrote when you were at Tustin and just a wonderful wonderful experience I also Thank wanted you. to share that um I recently have had COVID and I thought I was going to leave my body. And as a result of that experience, I have a whole new um, feeling uh, experience, I guess it's a better word, about life. And as, as a result of uh, <laughs> not expecting to survive those moments, um, <clears throat> I come to the uh, conclusion that it is okay to be in the body or not in the body. And the most important thing is to spend every single moment in love so that I don't have any yearnings in my life. I just choose every moment to be love. Well, what I would say, Sharon, is that you, as a result of COVID, have experienced an awakening. This is really profound. Awakening is the shift out of human consciousness into awareness. It's a shift where you have awareness with a capital A of small a awareness. You will never see the world the same way again. If Once you make this shift, there's no way back. The bridge gets blown up. <laughs> <laughs> I, see, I definitely see that. I definitely do see that. And I, I personally see it as a, a, a great blessing. Because when you, when you have dropped all the things of humanness, in other words, you just live your life in the moment. That's right. Good morning. Good morning. Good day. Hello. Goodbye. <laughs> it's just, it's just is. It just is. And an example of that for me, and it applies to my brother and also to Mary Pat, his beloved, is I don't worry about memory loss. Sometimes I don't remember things. 
And at 82 or 83, uh, I experience short-term memory loss sometimes. What I do is I give it to the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit wants me to remember it, it brings it back. <laughs> yes, I experienced that too. <laughs> you live totally in the now moment. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I'm so glad you came on. That is really, thank really beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. For thank you so us. much. Sharon, yeah. and, and borrowing an iPhone to be with us and definitely very glad you're here. And I love what you said, choose. So I also uh, want you to help add it uh, with how to put Casey after his last name, Fabian. Yes, so... Ed, I believe you should see on the on the top right of your camera, there are three dots. If you click on the three dots, see if you have the option to rename. Otherwise, I can rename it for you. But if you see that, then you are welcome to do that anytime yourself. I'll, I'll ask you You're to muted, uh, Ed. see. Yeah, go, why don't you go ahead and rename it for him, Fabian? Yeah, unmute. Okay, wait a minute. Well, as you wanted it a teaching moment, then I decided everybody might want to know. Um, so otherwise, I'm happy to do it. So do you see the three dots, Ed? There it is. I get it. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> We yeah. all are still learning, <laughs> yeah. and you, even in your 80s, are still learning. <laughs> I hope no one on this call forgets that we're all still learning. In fact, with Sharon's experience, we may actually be moving into or have already experienced this shift that I'm talking about. It is a cosmic shift out of the subtle realms into the causal realms, or what is called awareness of awareness, or um, anyway, that that was a research term, so you don't need, even need to know them. So who would like to share next? And Sharon, you can take down your hand, or Fabian can do that there. I just did that, yeah. Um, oh. Ed. Want to go, Ed? Okay, let's let's do that. Yeah. Am I unmuted? You're fine. I am? Okay. Well, the thoughts that came to me is that love is not an agenda. Uh, love, um, it is a, a nurturing and a healthy expression of consciousness. Yes. And that's kind of the way that I describe love because I think it's all inclusive. That's a wonderful description. So it's nurturing and it's healthy. Uh, Expression. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. So let's have some other people weigh in. What came for you? Uh, yeah. Barbara Yan. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think I'm unmuted. Can you yes, hear me? You are. Okay. I had, it was interesting because when we went into the silence, I actually saw this spiral. It was like a whirlwind. But I saw faces, people that I've known throughout my life. And it was just kind of coming in and coming out. It was really interesting. And um, I just got some thoughts about that, thinking about how all these people, that I, some of whom I haven't thought about for a long time, made such a difference. And there was so much joy and happiness with each of these people. I, we just had wonderful relationships and lots of fun and I had lots of words that I wrote down after that and it was happiness and change was a big thing because some of these people we were I, I'm still friends with I mean I talk to them occasionally and I still have interactions and some people it was wonderful when we were together and doing things but then we all went our separate ways and kind of lost touch, but I still think of them and I hold them very dear. So it was just interesting to think about how that happened, that the spiral showed me kind of people going in and out of my life this, the whole time I've been here. And it just made me think of 
words like great, grateful and love and joy and fun and feeling loved and cared for and enjoying what was happening in the moment and then moving on to whatever was next. So, and the other thing about um, one of our other participants talked about how you made a difference in their life. And when I first went to Unity of Tustin, I didn't really know you, but I came and my sister at the time would come whenever she was visiting from Colorado. And there were a couple of really difficult times in my life. And I, I needed you and I didn't really know you personally, but it was just such a, an amazing experience. It was very uplifting. And I, after I would go and listen and go to some of the author's talks that, that you had, it was just, it just helped me through some tough times at that period in my life, a couple of them. So it's just all, it's just love is so important. I mean, we just, <laughs> we need it. And, and it helps you give back love also. So. It's about giving and receiving. It is. If you do just one side of the loop, it's it's not complete. No. It's an infinity loop, and it's about giving and receiving. But the way you activate it is that you give first. That's real. Give, and it will be given unto you. I love to quote scripture. Give comes before receive. And it will give, and it will be given unto you. And this applies to everything in your life, whether it's love, it also applies to tithing relative to uh, mm -hmm. your commitments to your spiritual good. So it's really, really wonderful. Thank you, Barbara. Mm -hmm. And you brought up something I wanted to sort of give you an update on, everyone an update on. I told you I was going to announce something. Everything in my life, everything has been put on hold because of my brother's experience over the last 21 days. I was planning to launch a course that's on hold. There's, I'm not going to do that. I thought it would be in February or March that I I have to, this is the song, what I did for love. What I'm doing right now is for love. It's for love of my brother. And it has put everything else in my life on hold. I haven't even attended courses that I've signed up for and paid for because I've been waiting for calls or be, I'm involved in calls for my brother and um, have to listen to the replay. So we're still going to have the, a course, but it's been delayed because of what I did for love. <laughs> so you'll know that... Uh, uh, that's a, a simply a postponed, <laughs> uh, not not canceled, not disappearing, but just uh, yeah, time and timelessness. So thank you, Barbara. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing Patty's in, hand up and Fabian's hand up. Yeah, let's go to Patty. You're unmuted. Thank you. Um, Marge, if you and I shared a past life, I think it was when I was in the Beguine community back in the 1300s in Holland, Holland, Belgium. So I don't know if you've ever felt like that was one of your past lives, but that's what came to me. What and kind it, of a community was it? The, the Beguine community of lay women who were a, a real spiritual force. Um, my father's yep. family came to uh, Pennsylvania because a, a Huguenot woman was fleeing from France to Switzerland to Holland to England to America with her 10 kids for religious freedom. So, you know, there's that in within our, our genetic makeup, I think. But I, I wanted to talk about love. Before from... you leave that, before you leave that, okay. I, as you were speaking, I went into my own heart and I got a huge yes that we okay. did share that past life. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, I just finished my second go through of A Course of Love, <clears throat> which is a follow on sort of an advanced course of miracles. And 
it's 600 pages and we did it twice. And so what I got from that is that love is, a, is the creative force. It is consciousness that we all share. And there is a type of love that we individually have with other individuals, or we can have it with our passions like writing or music or art. But um, a channel love, there can be a love of doing this. Like you said, you open, uh, you give, and then you receive. But there's also the love of just beingness, where you're one with spirit and you appreciate love in others. And you don't have to necessarily do it. You just, you see the beauty, the love, the outpicturing of love wherever you are. And just by having that presence, then you, you, you do give, give love to others. But yeah. you're, you're not actively channeling it to one relationship. It radiates from your heart. Right. And literally, it can fill a room. I, I had the amazing experience. I was in my 30s. It was before I even met Ed, I think, um, of meeting one time a person by the name of Jack Swartz. And I went to him and I wanted a reading. I would heard him speak at Unity Temple on the plaza. And I went to him and signed up for a reading and had I, I was waiting out in the outer office where his wife was letting people in. It, they had a suite in the hotel. And, and then he, she said, um, uh, he's ready for you now. And he, she, he opened, she opened the door into his uh, office space. And, and uh, I stood in the door. I didn't know where to sit, uh, whether we would sit by his desk or whether we would sit where there were two chairs. And so I just stood there for him to wait. And, and he didn't say a word. For several minutes, I just stood there in silence. And then he motioned for me to come over and sit down at the desk where he was sitting. And he said to me, do you know anything about auras? And I said, no, <laughs> not really. And he said, I want to tell you that when you came into the room, your aura filled this entire room. And your aura was blue and gold. Wow. Said so that is the messenger wave. And you came in to be a messenger. <laughs> and I mean, I didn't have a clue what he was talking about. My human mind didn't speak his language. It didn't know what he was, but something in me simply said, yes, I know this is true. So this is what you're talking about, Patty, that this vibrational field will fill the room. <clears throat> and I used to stand at the back of the sanctuary when I was the minister at Unity in Tustin. And I would come and stand at the back. And when they started singing Surely the Presence, I would just stand there and intentionally allow that auric field of love to fill the room, to fill the room. And then on the second verse, I would walk up to the platform and step up on the platform. So this is an invisible field, invisible. You don't, most people don't even believe it. They think you're making it up if you tell them. So I never tell him. Now I'm telling the world. <laughs> so much for saying you never tell them. Uh, but you notice there's not, uh, well, uh, let's go back to your statement about it radiating. Do you understand what I'm saying, Patty? you're muted of course it's it's just being connected with the the all presence that's already there all right it is and we have just time for fabian to share briefly we're almost out of time fabian thank you i will make it brief then um patty first of all so interesting to hear you have that connections with the in french beguinage the beguins because 
I have, every time I've gone to some of those places in Belgium, I felt a deep connection, but I never associated that with a past life. But now you planted another little seed for me. You um, may have been there at the same time. And that may have been one of our intersections in time. And you were perhaps there when Patty and I were there. It definitely could be one, one more that we didn't know yet. <laughs> um, so... There were several parts and because we've talked a lot about synchronicities before, I won't go there, but I wanted to bring up one thing that um, I received as a message, but I don't know if you all know what Barba Papa is. Is anyone familiar with Barba Papa? So I'll just share the screen so yeah, you have a visual. So this is a cartoon um, from 1970 but what I got which is it's a I got that before but this was related to what we're talking about here it's uh they shape forms into anything and everything so this is the message I got this is true also of love that takes unlimited forms shapes faces and experiences on the human plane a Barba Papa love story between you and the all that is unlimited expressions. So I just wanted to add that. I love that video. And it looks like the butterflies that come and land on you when you're out in the backyard. <laughs> you know, we are miracles living an embodied experience. We are beings of light that are called to love. And that's why you're on this call today. Notice that you're on a call that is entitled Called by Love Institute. A Called by Love Institute is a precious, precious vehicle of consciousness. So we are out of time. And uh, oh, this has been wonderful for me. Just beautiful. Thank you so much for being part of it. And let's close with Liebestrom, Dream of Love. Thank you, Marge. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. It's been absolutely wonderful being with you. <laughs> oh, you fill my heart with joy. <laughs> you fill my heart with love. You fill my heart with peace. The peace that passes understanding. And um, it's such a gift. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>